Oh, <laughs> oh. I was hoping I, there would be someone who had been to Iran, and I, and of course, Deb. Oh. I just finished a class um, on uh, grassroots, um, grassroots activism in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we had quite a session, um, and uh, so we ended hope with some hope uplifting. We'll see. Um, so there's an article in the New York Times today that Israel, Israel is using facial recognition. Is it using what? Facial recognition. Oh, yes. Against the Palestinians with, on the Palestinians. You mean I've read the article. As right. they come through the gates or what? I just have points. But I haven't read oh, the article. Yeah. I just printed it out for reading. Yeah. Um, Actually, yeah. was that the article on AI? No, it's just an article in the New York Times today. Yes, well, so there's an article <clears throat> this morning on AI. I, I don't know. Artificial just intelligence. Just facial recognition, so I don't know. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh. Good. Um, oh, this is the one. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I brought, I didn't make enough copies, but I thought it would be interesting um, for the su supposed um, uh, division of uh, uh, organizations within the Iranian government, which are appointed or elected, supposedly. Mm -hmm. So this came from, um, let's see, the, um, the Council on Foreign Relations. So I'll pass that out. But first, um, what I'd like to do is I'll introduce myself and then um, hope to go through the uh, rest of you and ask you whether you have been to Iran or to your um, the Middle East general, or, and what is of particular concern to you? Perhaps drawing from some of the questions that were raised. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as some of you know, <clears throat> my background is primarily, has been primarily in Egypt, one of the other major powers in the Middle East, and kind of, uh, uh, competes, shall we say, in, in prominence with Iran. Both have very long histories. And so there are some similarities and, and uh, differences. Of course, um, Iran represents the key Shia Muslim country, as opposed to Egypt, which follows the Sunni uh, division in the, in the Middle East. And uh, so I, I have not, unfortunately, been able to go to Iran, but I know some of you have, and you have uh, long um, experiences in that country. And so I, I look forward to hearing what your uh, experience has been done, has been, and then we'll have a discussion on perhaps the most concerning points of Iran-US relations. So um, I'm going to see, um, okay, Alice, and, and those, those of you who have just um, come today, uh, I, I look forward to hearing from you, because I know both of you who are not maybe a part of the follow-up discussion group have been to Iran at different periods, Deb and, um, and Marta, so, uh, okay. 
Um, Alice Arlen. Okay. Bob Ashton. Not here. Where's the line? Hmm? No, it's not oh. online now. Oh, I didn't realize it was online. Oh, it was Zoom. Yeah. Also. Fine. Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, Alice Arlen. No. Okay. Uh, Kathleen Billings. She's, she's not here today. No. Okay. Uh, Polly Burke. Yeah. Oh. So. I have not been been there. Okay. All right. So, what is of, of particular interest to you on Iran? Just anything that you throw out and what your friends throw out. Okay. You learn. Okay. Um, Polly Burke. No, that was oh, that was you. you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Sally Costley. Um, Bill Dunn. We, I don't think we had a roster of, of who's people. Well, that, Joyce very kindly <laughs> provided it to me. Um, I think I don't know him. Pat Finnegan. Yes. Ah. Oh, Pat Finnegan. Are you there? <laughs> Okay. Well, mm -hmm. William Franks. Quite a few. Franks? No. Okay. Yeah, he, he used to be here. Okay. Dory. Oh, He's in Turkey this week. Hmm? He's in Turkey this week. Jack Cruz. Oh, he was going to miss. Ah, okay. Uh, Daryl Gear. I know. Here. That. Okay. Yeah. Are you there? <laughs> okay. Uh, Richard Klein. No. no. Okay. I'm here. I'm online. Okay. So, have you been to um, uh, Iran or the Middle East? No, but I have a very good friend from Iran who keeps me up to date on what's happening. Okay. And uh, I have a lot of questions in terms of the reading that we did today, uh, mostly having to do with uh, the the new developments between Saudi Arabia and Iran establishing uh, relations. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. Um... Sven Lee? Uh, I've been there oh. in 83 and 85. Uh, and before that, I had some of the uh, college friends. But, um, my, my concern or question is about the uh, 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 state and the religion, and, and the religion running the state uh, or dominant power in the state, uh, as it is. Uh, in several countries. Okay. Okay. Um, Eva McClicker. Okay. Sierra Parker. All right. Um, Mila Plavsik. Eileen Purdy. I am here, yes I am. Yes. Now I would take and you know where I've been. Turkey. But I haven't been to anywhere else over there. But I have to echo the person online. I the thought the one the article that's in the book is tremendous. It has a lot of good information. Okay. But it's out of date. Things have changed so much even since this was written. They didn't have a relationship with Saudi Arabia. I mean it was just totally opposite of what's, what's in that book, but I thought it was interesting. So I, I'm interested in, in what your thoughts are related to the changes in the Middle East and what's happening with Iran related uh, to all of that stuff and what, would, what we should do, what we should be doing. Uh, okay. Um, well, that's always the problem of um, 
articles <laughs> because in the fast changing world because they're always out of date and i i just in fact um i was just reading an article on artificial intelligence which uh, deb and i know uh, we were very interested in uh, and there's a big article as i said this morning in, in the new york times on the founder of artificial intelligence is beginning to doubt oh yeah absolutely the, yeah, the impact is coming yeah yeah and uh and one of the articles i was reading the person said the world is changing so much that there is not a good book out on it yet because you can't keep up keep it up and that and that's the case in the middle east uh, some things change a lot, some things stay very much the same. And so uh, we will try to bring you up to date um, on what's been going on. Um, so, uh, Robin Ratcliffe. Um, let's see, two. Bonnie Baden. Goodness. Uh, John Karen Saucier, yes. Uh, we've just been to Egypt and Jordan uh, in recent, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. Our first trip to the Middle East. And, um, but for us, it's more about learning. It's just uh, part of the world that we don't know a whole lot about, but we're excited to learn something about it, as was the one, of course, on Israel and Palestine. So right. it's kind of the, one of those things that when you were in a different field all your life, we were both in medicine, we never. So my education on the world history kind of ended with Western Civ in college, and since then it was like read a little of. I read mostly about places where I traveled, and I'd see that in headlines, I would read about it. But now that I've been in the Middle East, it wasn't high on my radar, which I'm not bragging about. I'm, <laughs> I feel very embarrassed about, but yet yeah, yeah. Um, like to learn about it. But later, rather than <laughs> never at all. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, and John. John. Yes, uh, my own experience with uh, Iran is uh, when I was in high school, there was a program at a local college and invited people from Iran there. So the first time I heard about Tehran and could look it up. Since then, i uh, just be curious as to where the U.S. is going with its sanctions and with the nuclear power issue. Here we are with that. Uh, good, thank you. Uh, Jamie Willie? Oh, I haven't been to the Middle East, but um, I'll let go of the previous comments. Just the same. Okay. Now, I have several who are, who are ju just here. Yes. I'm Judy Johnson. And um, I've been to Israel in, uh -huh. in the uh, 90s. Um, and my, my, my immediate connection with Iran is that I have a very close friend who um, teaches economics. And every year, she, she, she and her family, they're Jewish, um, were forced out of Iran. I think she might have even had a connection to Israel, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. They were forced out of Iran in 79, scattered mm -hmm. all over the world. So I know her personally, and I also used to try to, and, you know, we would talk about things, and I would also edit some of her articles that she would publish. And then, um, and every year she would go off on a sabbatical to some place ending in Stan. <laughs> I think she's very homesick, even though she was young. And, um, so she's now in Tajikistan teaching. Tajikistan, yeah. Yes, and uh, I talked to her on WhatsApp, which I still don't quite understand, but she was so excited about what was happening in Iran, the protests. And, and um, so my, my, and I, I just watched, I don't know if some of you saw America and the Taliban that was on PBS. Did oh, yes. That? I have it on my list of things to see. I loved it, I loved it. And, um, so I'm wondering if there's any connections between the women in in uh, Afghanistan and the and, and the women in um, Iran. 
and you know, if there's any hope. Uh, if you're writing down that program, it's on program. Yes. Uh, yeah. They were always great, but this one I thought was great. Right. Good. Uh, yeah, of course, the, uh, there are many Afghan refugees in Iran. I mean, that was one source of re uh, refuge, as well as, of course, in, in Pakistan. And uh, so they, of course, had connections. Um, how many returned is another question. I, I'm not sure, but that would be a good question, too. Uh, for. But certainly the, the role of women is very important. And it has been over there. Uh, and of course, this brings up the whole question. Uh, I've heard so many of you say, I don't know anything about Iran. Well, why? Because, all right, it, there, it was not taught in schools because the general course in world history, you, know, you may have a chapter on um, <clears throat> ancient history, but nothing about modern day. That, that's one of the problems. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, and then, of course, with the technological revolution, um, of course, media, there, there was much more coverage of Iran over the years, and particularly, you know, of course, since 79. And that, that's another thing that we're going to be talking about. But first, I also want to hear from, let's see, Marta. <clears throat> okay, I am grossly out of date, but I was in Iran from 1970 to 1973. My husband was with the embassy, he was a political officer. Um, he spent most of his time going down into the bazaar and talking to, the, and talking to the merchants to see how they felt about Iran and then trying to send that information back to the White House. But the, at that time, the ambassador wouldn't let those discussions go back, which was very interesting, because uh, they didn't want to hear about it. Uh, they didn't want to hear how how he was hanging on by his by his friends, thumbs, whatever. Uh, but I also have lived in Saudi Arabia for five years, and so I'm very interested. I can't believe that Iran and Saudi Arabia are talking to each other. <laughs> That's the, it doesn't that doesn't happen, but it is. That just shows to me how the Middle East is changing. The, the relationships are changing unbelievably. I yes. think. Um, UAR and Israel, I mean, I can't, you know. Anyway, um, and then they were in Syria for two years. So, um, for Syria. Uh, anyway, uh, I try to follow all this because I'm, I really love the people. Yeah. I just, we really liked being there, you know, 15 years, and, and you know, we really enjoyed the whole thing, and and so I try to follow it, and so I worry about it. I just worry about it. I worry, I can't, I can't believe how terribly the Palestinians are being treated right now. I can't believe that, yeah, I can't believe our, our, our speaker of the house is over in Israel talking to Netanyahu. Yeah. So, but, He's inviting it. It's very difficult to swallow. <coughs> uh, anyway, uh, so uh, I'm, I, I mean, I'm interested in the gamut. I'm interested in the women. I'm interested in the relationship. I can't believe um, um, what's his name, MBS in Saudi Arabia. That's yeah. anyway. That's why I'm here. Normally, I have another class at this time. I live in Ocean View, and so. I have not been to great decisions this year because I have another class, but I couldn't resist coming to hear about Iran. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's good. That's good. And Deb, I so Marta, salam alaikum, hello, yeah. hope <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so similar to Marta, um, although it was my father, he was deputy chief of station in Tehran from '58 to '60. And then he went back to Langley and um, ran the Iran desk for a number of years. But um, so my connection to Iran is more emotional. Um, 
because I was there when I was um, 12, 13, 14. And, um, you know, it, it's such a beautiful country. I mean, it is so, really? oh, mm -hmm. it's gorgeous. Of course, we lived in a very nice place. Mm -hmm. and, what was beautiful? Um, the mountains. Um, mm -hmm. We lived in um, Shemron, which is um, mm -hmm. was down the street from the Shah's Summer Palace. Yeah. Um, it's just considered part of Tehran, but the northernmost part. And um, uh, it, it's mostly compounds, mm -hmm. and inside the compounds is where you live. And there's beautiful trees and um, and there's uh, pools, you know, but they don't look like normal swimming pools, but um, more elegant. And um, uh, we used to sleep, at, I mean, we had like three um, decks on our house and used to sleep at the, uh, outside at night on the top deck. And um, we could hear uh, the mullahs calling the faithful to prayer. Oh. And that was one of the memories I have of Tehran. Um, falling asleep and hearing the mullahs, you know, uh, chanting. And um, of course, what we've been, it was very cool at night. And when we woke up in the morning, it was blazing hot. <laughs> and we chomped out of bed. <laughs> but, um, the, and, and uh, if you drive up in the mountains, it's, it's stunningly beautiful. I mean, with waterfalls and um, rivers and uh, if you cross over the Alborz Mountains to, to, to go to the Caspian Sea, which is what we did um, on vacation, um, that's a beautiful journey too. Although back in those days it was very treacherous because, you know, there were a lot of switchbacks and, and uh, one time my father drove, um, he had let our chauffeur go um, on vacation and um, it, he kept yelling at us kids to just lie down in the back so that he could get us where we needed to go. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, but I guess talking about politics with Tehran, um, what's evident to me from being there then uh, was the society there was extremely secular and westernized. Um, the upper class women were all wearing suits, um, latest Paris fashions. Um, we were there too for the wedding of uh, Empress Farah and Shah, and um, all her clothes were from Paris. Um, so it's such a contrast to where we are now. Um, it's such a shame because the extremists got in and took over. I mean, of course, they were always there. And the Shah certainly was no angel, as we know. Um, but it just seemed that um, he could have modulated his behavior and things may have worked out. Um, and, and I suppose that I um, maybe I'm a little naive about it, but I do think that we would be in a totally different place. Uh, what does the group think? I mean, what do you think happened? I mean, could we have, I mean, was it inevitable that the Ayatollah was going to take over? Or, or do you think that, um, the Shah could have hung on longer, changed his behavior. Well, the problem, of course, <clears throat> is the contradictions. I mean, you yeah. have you had a modernizing monarchy, yeah, um, and you the <clears throat> modernization under the previous Pahlavi, uh, Reza the father, um, he forced modernization onto mm -hmm. Iran. Yeah. And, uh, but of course it was, you know, maybe paper thin. Um, and that's a, one of the major problems is that 
you can't came in and of course Iran was faced with power conflicts between the Soviet Union and the US and we and so it when it did get onto the side of the allies of course um, their big complaint the Iranians complaint what as time went on was the control of the Iran companies, the, the oil companies, oh, right, the by the British. Yeah. yeah. Now that I agree with. Yeah. Yeah. And the British just hung on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it it had an empire, and it didn't want to lose it. And people don't seem to like to lose power. <laughs> Mossadegh, don't forget yeah. Mossadegh. And, and, and Mossadegh. So Mossadegh. That was in that was in fifty three. Right? In the fifties, yeah. yeah. Yeah, fifty three. And he was the only charismatic democratic yep. leader ever to come about that, in Tehran, that's right. or Iran. And the CIA, unbelievably, mm. this was 53, uh, staged a coup yeah. and got rid of Mossadegh. I mean, it's, it's really awful when you think about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's a very good book out on the, all the Shah's men, which uh, read it. Yeah. talks about uh, the... Um, uh, the coup. Yeah. The, the, you know, most of that was of the nationalist, uh, really, really nationalist party. And he wanted to nationalize the oil company. I mean, they weren't getting anything, or not enough, certainly. And the conditions of the workers were terrible. Uh, but as usual, of course, as I was saying, the, the Brits don't like to lose power. So they, they were very worried about what Mossad was doing, just as, for instance, the, the uh, Brits attacked um, uh, Egypt. Right. They didn't like. They didn't like yeah. Nasser. Yeah. So bump him off. Uh, and so that was that was really one of the problems. And so uh, Mossad, and of course the U.S. kind of backed uh, the yes. Brits. Yes. Because of course we had oil interests, and they, they had of course been uh, we'd been there, and so we basically took over in influence after the Brits uh, Brits left. Um, so we'll talk about that. For, I want to hear Betty. This is my husband John. We tried to go to Iran, but for whatever reason we didn't get the permission. I've forgotten what it was. We went to Syria and we've been to Israel. Um, and I just have a lot to learn about it. So when did you try to go? You know, I'm just saying it was it 2010? Around 2010 and then they had an uprising, remember? Yeah. 2010. Yeah. And we stopped communicating with the the travel people in Iran at that time. They stopped communicating with us because of the, it was an objection to an election, I think. That yeah. Arbulus uh, felt that the election was a sham, and so there were uprisings in the street, and uh, so they they stopped processing our visas, and uh, so we instead went to had a nice trip to Syria yeah. huh? instead, and uh, but uh, never never made it to uh, Iran. My interest in, in Iran started years ago when I was. So I was a much younger man, and I supervised construction of a Muslim school, and that got me interested in Islam in the whole in the whole Middle East. And we've been over there a few times since, uh, visiting a, a friend, who, a Palestinian writer in occupied East Jerusalem, a uh, pretty well known writer, who's actually visited us here as well. And so we've been back and forth a few times, stayed in the uh, in the old city in the, in the Muslim quarter. Which uh, I would encourage everybody to do. If you ever go to Jerusalem, stay in the old city, stay in the Muslim quarter. You're very well treated, and it's a very, very interesting. One of the, uh, I think it's one of the most exciting cities in the world. We happen to be there at the time that Passover, the uh, uh, Christian mm -hmm. and Orthodox, um, and maybe the end Ramadan all coincided. Within three or four days there, and there were people from all over the world. It was a 
It was hard to move, but it was very a very exciting place to be. Where was the Muslim school you oversaw? In the West Africa. In West Africa. Oh really? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. Sierra Leone, yeah. Yeah. It was the Peace Corps, it was our honeymoon. Oh, oh really? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Let's see, have I missed it? Ah, yes. I'm John Erickson. Um, this is my first time here. I've been in Florida for the last six months. But um, my, my question is, um, I'm interested in the conflict between, well, I've been to Egypt. And mm -hmm. so but I'm interested in the conflict between Israel and Iran. Uh, and because of our support of Israel, if Israel did get into a conflict with Iran, would we be in a war with Iran? Well, that's the, the, the big question. Yes. But that, we'll, we'll talk about, but of course, um, Israel had hoped to have a relationship with Saudi Arabia. Speaking of um, change, uh, following, of course, of the UAE, um, because, um, you know, MBS, the leader now of, of um, uh, Saudi Arabia, is a modernizer. And um, it was, he, He's still, I mean, Saudi Arabia is very canny and it wants, it, it feels responsible, of course, for the places of worship in, in um, Jerusalem. I mean, that is a major center for Islam, not just Mecca, but, um, uh, but Jerusalem. And the, um, so on the one hand, he, he wants technological relations with different countries, and he's a modernist. But on the other hand, you know, he's kind of supposedly the leader. I mean, Saudi Arabia is the leader of the Muslim world, uh, and that's where you, you know, Mecca, the pilgrimage. They want it safe for travel to to uh, Mecca. So it, it's a very difficult position for him. Uh, but then, speaking of the relations between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, you do have the major differences in the religion. That is, Saudi Arabia is really the home of Sunni Islam, and Iran is leader of uh, Shia. And of course, this whole div division uh, occurred centuries ago, just after the prophet uh, died. So, um, and Shia, Shias have been persecuted actually in Saudi Arabia uh, along the, the eastern uh, kind of border. Um, so it, it's, it's a very difficult, but at times of change, there's a tremendous technological development, um, and MBS, I think, and um, the leaders, some of the leaders in Iran came to independent <coughs> decisions that they wanted uh, to solve things because there are other more important issues at hand. Um, the, of course, the Saudis have not been happy with and they've c conducted this war in Yemen um, because they feel threatened by the Houthis, who are somewhat um, Shia. Um, and they've also been, you know, concerned about the Iranian support for the Houthis. And it's become a very expensive operation. Uh, so that's very difficult. And I think the Iranians, you know, they have other things on their mind. Uh, and they have developed a string of allies to the north of Israel. Uh, they have supported, gained relations uh, with um, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, who are primarily Shia. Uh, they've developed relations with Syria, 
as you know, uh, and they, you know, you've got the Assad regime, and it's been supported by uh, Iran. So they have a string of influence in the Fertile Crescent. Uh, so I think, and of course, the Iranians may think that this agreement will then uh, perhaps mitigate uh, the, the threat from uh, from uh, Israel. I mean, basically, Iran one up to Israel uh, in an association. Um, and so now Israel is saying, hey, we want to get together with uh, Saudi Arabia. But that's, uh, that's been kind of challenged, shall we say. So that's that's a, a big uh, issue. Thing, things are very definitely uh, changing. Yes? I, I've never heard that before, if I heard right, that um, the leader of Saudi Arabia is the leader of the Muslim world. Did I get that right? Yeah, technically. I mean, um, I, I don't think whether or not the other Muslims think of him really as the leader, mm -hmm. but Saudi Arabia as a country, as a center of Islam, mm -hmm. yes, that is very definitely, you know, he's in a way, yeah, technically. And that's it's been that way for how, how, when did it start to be that way? Why? When? Oh, when? Oh, basically, in the last few years, when, when I think 2015, when um, he was, see, the whole mode of, um, leadership selection in the monarchy is very kind of obtuse. Um, you know, it's a family. And so King Salman uh, is technically the monarch, but he's aging and he can select, you know, with, um, his son. And of course, there have been contenders for for that leadership, for the prime ministership. Mm -hmm. And so uh, MBS is young and he's ambitious and uh, he edged out his cousin. Uh, Atta, I think, uh, I, uh, 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 who was the intelligence chief. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the succession, there are all kinds of power politics within that family. So that, that's really- But don't you think that the leader of Islam has always been in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I mean, it goes way back. I mean, I think it's because it's Mecca and yeah. Medina. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. what? I'm sorry. Because it's Mecca and Medina. I mean, that. Oh, that's. And that, and that's yeah. where I was going to guess yeah. because otherwise I would I wouldn't uh, think that no. just the Sunni country would necessarily be the head because of the, the Muslim. Because it's Mecca and Medina. Because yeah. Shias are just as strong as they are. Yeah. Yeah. But it's because of what's there in their country. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean. Of course, you had the Ottoman Empire, <clears throat> and for a while, of course, during the Ottoman Empire, you had the Sultan basically appointed yeah, the right. Grand Sharif in Istanbul or Constantinople. But uh, there was always that center, you know, in Mecca. But the focus, of course, was in Istanbul for, under the Ottoman Empire. But then, of course, in the World War I, um, we wanted to break up the Ottoman Empire. And so we, uh, you had the Lawrence of Arabia, who started talking to the, uh, the leaders in, in Mecca. And uh, there you had the, the Sharif and then uh, Faisal and Abdullah and Zed uh, and um, let's see, that, that was the, the, the basic three. And Faisal connived with um, T.E. Lawrence, or T.E. Lawrence connived with Faisal. And Faisal wanted to be king of Syria because they had been promised the an Arab confederation. Uh, and they supported the idea to work uh, to fight against the Ottoman Empire, who chose by mistake, shall we say, the Germans. Mm -hmm. And so the um, 
so then you had Abdullah, who also was somewhat uh, ambitious. Well, the Brits, of course, being in power, said, okay, well, we'll give um, Abdullah Transjordan, the southern part, which the Brits had taken, assumed power over the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was between France and, and uh, uh, England. And so, uh, you know, you had um, uh, the Muslim lands and uh, Arabian lands coming up to greater importance. Um, and so Abdullah wanted part of Palestine to be under his um, so sovereignty in Transjordan, uh, which might have been okay, uh, okay, but then, and so he actually talked with the Zionist leaders and, and came to kind of a, a, a gentleman's agreement uh, and wanted to um, uh, say, okay, you take the northern part and I'll take the uh, 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 Jerusalem, but it's, Jerusalem's got to be inter internationally. He wanted a guarantee that um, uh, Jerusalem would be part of Palestine. So uh, anyway, the, the Saudi Arabia came into more prominence and of course Abdullah was um, uh, had a hand in dividing Palestine up besides the, the Brits. The Brits really took over under the mandate. And that's another story which we won't get into. But yes. So, but the but in Iran, you know, they had a developing democracy where it came from, and so there was there's always the, the religion behind. Yeah. So the culture and aspects can yeah. come forward, and and so there was a vibrant democracy. There was a semi vibrant yeah. democracy in Iran. Yeah. A short period of time. Right, yeah. but it was yeah. coming forward. Yeah. And even now, there are people elected to offices there. I mean, you know, Iran versus Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi Arabia doesn't have a. No. Doesn't have elections like in Iran. I mean, you know, we probably don't want to admit it, but they probably have some aspects in virtue that, that are following. Maybe what the people want. People are raising their hand for leaders in that country, aren't they? It isn't just somebody in the chair saying, "You, you, you, you're in charge." So people are part of a. Are you Democrat. talking about Iran? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, certainly, as you say, that there was um, a short a parliament, and so forth, uh, uh, dating back basically to. In 1906, but in different forms. There's a president now, though, of Iran. Correct? Yes, but uh, that's why I want you to. <laughs> to according to the book, yeah, the, the, the book says that the president has no power. It's a bureaucracy. He runs the bureaucracy. The real power is in the home. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you say too. Yeah. Um, but is there really graft though in oh you know in Iran? I mean is there you know so so the power structure that, I guess that's what I'm here to find out a little bit about is is what the you know so is the world of Iran all about just corruption or huh. are there are there institutions there that are semi honest and have a chance to serve the people, you know? Uh, I don't know. Well, it's, there's a complex set of institutions, stru structures, under the um, under the um, new constitution that was developed after the Iranian Revolution, 1979, and it kind of combined structures that had already been there, but with the new kind of uh, idea of religious supervision over all these institutions. So basically, uh, the supreme leader right. is the one. And they, and uh, he, his power is somewhat limited, but not 
really. I mean, he does have to listen to what's going on, but he has to, he's the supreme leader. Now, whether or not the people really respect him as the leader is another question. Because, um, and there have been articles written on that. Uh, he doesn't have the charisma that Khomeini had. We, uh, we may not think too much about the charisma of Khomeini. It's a different style, shall we say, from before. But he did lead the Iranian people to, through his sermons, uh, to rebel. And they were good and fed up with the system under the Shah. Because the Shah, while he was a modernizer, he was too attached, number one, to the US. And number two, he, he was very materialistic and he very dictatorial. I mean, very authoritarian. Well, and there was a lot of corruption. Yeah, and not to mention the Sabah. You know. The what? The secret police. Sabah. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Plan Sabah. And detail. The Sabah. Yeah. yeah. So that things had really gotten bad in uh, Iran. I remember seeing a probably a um, magazine article about the Sabak in 1978 um, yeah. about that. And interestingly, just on Friday in the Ali um, Great Decisions, there was a, someone who had been had been a professor in one of the, at Tehran University, not, not the Tehran University, another one. And this was in 73 to 74. And he said, um, it was becoming very oppressive uh, in the universities. And of course the universities were organizing demonstrations and so forth. Mm -hmm. And he felt kind of spied on. And he said after 74, he said, he got the hell out because it was um, becoming too much. Mm -hmm. And so it was really building up. Um, and uh, the American presence um, was, was really becoming too much. I mean, there's a lot of armaments being spread in... in um, Nixon and Kissinger came and visited. Not the, Nixon and Kissinger came to visit. Yes, them. yes, yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, it was... It was uh, and, there's a growing uh, antipathy towards the U.S. Uh, because of the, the the separatism that the Americans and foreigners um, have from the from the Iranians, that was another problem. I mean, you were saying that you lived in kind of a gated, of course it was embassy, uh, but a uh, gated community. Uh, Did you live in Sharon? No, I lived in uh, Dola. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. But the general in our next Gucci, American general, was, was uh, um, well, exploded. I mean, I uh, yeah. uh, can't think of the word, a bomb under, yeah. under his, in his car. While we were oh, there. yeah. Yeah. There was um, a lot of feeling against Americans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I mean, the, the biggest yeah. thing that I think was so terrible was the overthrow of Mossadegh. Yeah. And, I mean, Mossadegh had even gone to the United States, got um, the first Democratic leader who nationalized um, the oil for, for the Iranians yeah. only, and um, pissed off, I'm sorry for the expression, but the Brits, oh, because the yeah. Brits were fully invested and they had this gigantic um, community down there yeah. uh, at Kormshar, I think it was, and which is right on the, the sea. And, um, uh, you know, they had everything for their community, you know, swimming pools and you name it. And, but it was very self-contained. And so, and they were getting all this oil, which they desperately needed. And the U.S. was getting a lot of it, and the Brits were very upset when most of that nationalized the oil. So, so I mean, and so they 
we engineered this coup and brought back the um, the Shah. And then, of course, this the siege were really planned for for the uh, Khomeini coming back and the revolution. Yeah. But well, another starting fact was, of course, we chose to uh, accept uh, the Shah for medical treatment, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and that was the, a key feature because we were much too. I mean, you could feel sorry for him, but uh, it was too too much, too cozy. Yeah. Did he? Didn't he go to somebody else first, and then his? He went to Mexico. I think in Mexico. Mexico. We saw his grave last year. So I just asked him. It was in some random church in the middle of nowhere, and, and we were in this church, and they said that's the shawl that ran is buried right there. Wow. Oh. I just had a flashback of that. Mm -hmm. Mexico. Mm -hmm. So the the. Uh, the, the populace followed Khomeini at first because he was, they were pretty organized in that sense. I mean, he really uh, mobilized the clergy. Mm -hmm. And the people thought, well, um, uh, let's go along with him. I, I don't think they expected what would happen then later. But there was, I mean, the women too, they adopted the hijab, uh, whereas as some of you were saying that the women were very, I mean, secular, yeah. they they were unveiled and, and so forth, um, but they adopted the, the hijab uh, to um, protest. And by the way, the whole subject of the veil is fascinating because it's used uh, by both governments and the popular for different purposes. What do you mean the governments and the populace? Uh, populace. populace. Um, for some, I mean, in some countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and then Iran, um, it's a government policy to impose the hijab. On the other hand, the hijab has been used in other countries which do not re have any dress code as a sign of protest against the government. So, and, and a form of identity. So I mean, you can put it on. Maybe. They put it yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Willingly. Yeah. So willingly. They adopt yeah. the, the hijab and you and it also it, it's kind of a recognition of identity for instance you see um quite a few women in portland who are covered mm -hmm. now is this because they want to they want to preserve their cultural identity from where they came or is it kind of dictated by their um by their men folk shall we say as a you know form quote unquote protection or control it, it's a fascinating um one doesn't know for sure but um it just i mean in the case of iran you didn't have the, the, any rule regarding hijab you know traditionally women wore it, others but in the in the rural areas they didn't have the um hijab you, you can't farm with all kinds of uh clothing around you um it, it's in, interfering but at the same time uh it, it's an urban phenomenon by the way Still, is it still in the rural areas that don't wear a hijab? Well, you know, it, they they have rules on it, but you know, it's not really that enforced. And as a sign of reform, I mean, you saw under recent Khatami, for instance, and the Huran, uh, um you had the um, the rules relaxed a bit. 
And so women were starting to take it, you know, take advantage of that. And they were sick and tired of being told to wear the hijab. I mean, women are really have uh, become very independent with modernization. So then they were saying, screw the hijab. Um, we're not going to do it. But of course, that became a key symbol in September. When one of the, the young women, Mahsa, uh, was, um, she took it, uh, she, she was not wearing the hijab, and the, the re regime had started to tighten up again mm -hmm. uh, because they were getting worried about the freedom. And so they arrested her for being, having bad hijab and was mistreated in prison. And this sparked popular uprising, certainly the, the women, and it spread across all, all classes. Well, she died, right? She, she died. died. Yeah. So on YouTube. Yeah. And yeah. Because, yeah. because the regime had adopted all these restrictive laws regarding uh, women. I mean, it's still very, very repressive. And women had had the, the, the laws um, loosened considerably. And you had a professional class of women. Um, and one of, the, of course, the Nobel Prize winner, Shuri Abadi, she was a lawyer and trained to be a judge. And um, uh, she couldn't do it after the revolution. She had so, to. what do you think is going to happen with that? Yeah, that situation. It's gone on for so long, but it seems to be. I don't know. I don't. I don't even want to guess what you'd say the status. The right situation now. of the a job. A job. Oh, um, I think women <laughs> have become much more independent, and I think it's going to. It may well continue to to defy, mm -hmm. but that's not that's that, that, that's a standoff. That, that that's not a resolution. What do you do you think there'll be a resolution? Re a resolution or revolution? <laughs> <laughs> Either or. Yes. So I I'm so happy to be here. I am. Um, my name is Kiam Hajizadeh. I'm born in Iran and oh. raised in Iran and came to the United States in 1978. But I ended up going back for a few years, so I have experienced both sides in oh. the Shah's time and the, the new regime's time. And I can provide some more important side yeah. information for anybody who's interested. Oh. Particularly on the hijab, anybody wants to just talk about the hijab is one big subject. Iran as a whole entity is another big subject. The internal versus external, meaning like Israel and Palestine, all these other countries, Yemen. These are all different subjects that are different, but they're kind of interrelated. On the hijab side of it, and this is my personal, so it's very complicated this year. You have to talk about so many things, you know, yeah. from the parliamentary revolution that happened over a hundred years ago. That yeah. Iran was going to become a very democratic, the first democratic country in the whole region. And then Shah's father came to power. Reza Shah. Reza Shah. And he was a dictator. He was making do a lot of good things for the country. Yeah. You know? Uh, he was pushing people and forcing people to take their hijab, for example. Yes. So they say the forceful, you know, loss of the hijab. Then the new regime came, well, and then his son came to power after the Tzadik was overthrown. That was a really bad thing that happened. And that's basically, I would say, eventually that is what caused Shah to, to go. Because people had that 
they knew the democratic situation in their mind, and then all of a sudden somebody was brought in by the United States, they didn't like it, uh, obviously. You know, Joshua was also, in some ways, bringing some, I wouldn't say democracy, but modernization. <laughs> While he still had his, you know, the stick, and obviously there were pockets of resistance, and especially with things happening in Cuba, the armed struggle was another big thing that was coming to fruition in Iran, and Shah was obviously 100% against it. They executed so many of these uh, rebels, you know, the armed struggle people, but I'm just going so fast on all these different things, but. Uh, so eventually Shah was gone, and apparently there was this, what, well, people love this religious thing, right? Uh, everything under Khomeini was preaching Islam as a democratic thing for the society. In fact, Khomeini, when he was in, when he was in Paris, if you look at what he said there versus after, completely different night and a difference. There, there was no mandatory job. There was supposedly good elections, not the elections that are governed by a leader at the top who filters out. So there is a, an election, per right. say, in Iran, right? So I am, say, I am an independent person, wants to run for whatever, you know, become a president or House of Assembly or one of these things. First, I have to go through a big, long film. Yeah. So, if for some reason I forgot to do my, you know, prayers, I'm out. Mm. If for some reason I said something like I'm talking now here, yeah. I won't be able to run for mayor of the Portland or whatever, right? Mm. So, it's a pseudo democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a big pretend. In fact, they need the leader coming in. He recently said, Oh, we got an action, you know, this is beautiful democracy, what are you complaining about? So, anyway, I just thought too much, but uh, I can talk about yeah, so the yeah. hijab party again. So, when Shaw when was out, ousted and Khomeini came to power, initially, Nobody cared about it. Everybody was going out as before. When I was in Iran during the Shah's time, people were allowed to do whatever they want. If you wanted to have a job, a job. I was in the university, right? We had our the students were some of them were up to date, like you were saying, you know, ministers and whatever, you know. And there were some who were wearing their job. Nobody did that. Well, we had our classmates had the jobs, and those who didn't have. <laughs> we used to go with our girlfriends or boyfriends out. <laughs> no problem, right? <laughs> then we, the new regime came, and all of a sudden, yeah. everybody has to wear a job, and the job became mandatory. It wasn't supposed to be that. <laughs> and then the women came to the streets. They were really chanting against the uh, mandatory job. But they were clashed big time. They were, I mean, suppressed big time. And after that, this hijab became the red line of the United uh, Iranian government. Not if they find somebody who has just a stick yeah. of their hair out, this was as bad as it was early on. I even know my own sister's experience that, you know, I used to teach at university. And my sister was also working there. And one night, one day, the head of university saw her with her scope just laid back, and he went and mentioned that tell her that you didn't follow your job quota. Mm -hmm. That was so bad. Even us as as men, mm -hmm. they used to come to me. I was a professor of teaching, right? Oh, you know your. You know, you have a short sleeve, for example, you know, or one of your buttons is open. So anyhow, so the regime has been using this hijab as a stick to suppress women and men. And uh, it hasn't been something that people love to do. 
In fact, the people have a dual, dual sort of life over there. Mm -hmm. Outside is different. You have to wear your hijab. Inside, parties of all kinds. You know, men and women get together. They have fun. Mm -hmm. And they have to, this duality has been going on for 40 some years now. And every time there has been something, they have been suppressed and put down until the most recent uprising on the hijab. And from what I'm hearing from my, mm -hmm. my family back there, in fact, people are not giving a whatever to the hijab. People are coming out however they like. Every now and then there is some, you know, some uh, confrontations and things like that, but so far it looks like, at least on the hijab side, people are making some progress. And I think government eventually has to back down. And, uh, and some of the things we see, we say Saudi Arabia, for example. Obviously, it's international politics, for sure. Both of these countries have been involved in these big wars, like in Yemen, for example. But some of it is also from the inside, internal issues. Because there is a lot of pressure right now in the Iranian government to <laughs> open up a little bit. And if not, especially with the economical situation that they are mm. handling with, the, the embargoes, sanctions, they want to do the nuclear stuff, the, the economy is in shambles. All these things are making them to make some concessions too. This is my, of course, yeah. my personal perspective. So I just wanted to say a few words. Sorry Thank you very much. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you. Demographics in the country, aren't there, aren't there a lot of young people there? Very much so. Yeah. There are yeah, just a lot of young people. A lot of young people and the new uh, social networking. Yeah. Which is uh -huh. amazing that the government put that in place. People have access to, yeah. to the internet and everything, but they're controlled. You know, every now and then they <coughs> shut down everything. Right. But yeah, yeah. The, the majority of you know, the younger people, unfortunately, because of the the economy, there are, so, the, there are so many people who are uh, jobless, yeah. unemployed, especially the kids, you know, and many of them have already finished their, you know, they have gone to schools, they, you know, upper uh, higher education schools and everything, but there are many jobs for mm -hmm. Unless you know sure. somebody mm -hmm. in the system to get you in. Unless you follow some of the things they tell you to do. What do you teach? Quite, I'm sorry. sorry. I am a chemist, oh. and uh, I came to the United States in 1978, and I got my PhD from the University of Cincinnati. University I worked in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Oh. I worked here in Maine for 15 years for a company called Lydex. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm going to ask a question about. I think you have to work every day. Uh, by the way, I heard David Shaw speak last week. He was amazing, but uh, he's started by it. But uh, the the article here says that the young people in Iran certainly know the American culture because they, you know, love social media, but they don't like the United States. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And if it so, It has why? never been true uh, then and now. I mean, so we got to separate the Shahs and the regime, you know, the, the United States. The young people always had aspiration for some of the American cultures, I wouldn't say for everything, I came to the United States to do my education, right? And I ended up staying here. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, you know, so West Westernization is a thing that many of those countries, they, you know, the people may not like all of it, but you were mentioning the hijab, people use that as a symbol to protest against the government. Is that because they like to have hijab, or is that just no. they're, they don't like to be westernized too much? Yeah. Also, some people like to keep their, their in during the Shah, there were these major famous writers in Iran, 
we used to write like westernization, they were tabooing westernization. There are books that says this is that is against our culture. We are going to lose our identity. This is that. So the fear of becoming westernized was instilled in some of the people's mind, and that's kind of that's a piece of why the revolution happened. But I don't think it's all of is that just that cultural thing. I actually so Shah. One of the things he did, he made several major uh, changes in the country. One of them was he took a few dollars. Uh, uh, lands from them. Oh, and land and let people, you know, work on the land. There was no, so there was feudalism versus capitalism that Shaw was bringing. So he was letting go of these feudals, taking away their, their lands, mm -hmm. and some of those landowners were who the clergy, like mm -hmm. Khomeini and the like. Yeah. And they didn't like that. Right? Yeah. It wasn't no. just about, in fact, Shah himself was very religious. He was actually promoting Shia, Shiaism. And uh, the Imam Riza, his, his name is Imam Riza, his father's name. They used to go to pilgrimage to the place, to the shrine, every year, and do the prayers. And the mullahs had actually a special place in Shah's court. So what happened all of a sudden, Shah became a Satan. <laughs> Who was the, so I don't think it was all its combination no. of things. Yeah. Specifically, what happened in, in 1952 mm -hmm. when Mossad was, was taken down and Shaw was brought back in. Shaw was kicked out of the country, of course, by the people. But then the coup brought him back and that left a real bad face. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Shaw tried by making the, all these modernization, in his mind, those were great things, whether people liked it or not. Mm -hmm. And some of them were great things, of course. You know, all the universities we had. Yeah. I went to a, a, an English-speaking school. Back then, all our courses were taught in English. The books were in English. So, I mean, these are bad things? No. He did a lot of good things, but he yeah. did not tolerate anybody talking against him. Yeah. That was his fault. And uh, he could have prevented it by bringing a more parliamentary type of system that the Shah is only a figure like some of the other places we know. But he refused to do that unfortunately and now that's we got into a situation that's worse than that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's right. I mean, I, I was going to mention the White Revolution in 1961, mm -hmm. which, I mean, he was trying to modernize the country, but as you say, it, it's kind of from top down, but still, you know, the schools were created, and of course, that educated a great many people, and, uh, you know, they, they, they started to speak up. And, and the land reform, yeah. people don't like land reforms. The, the articulate ones, <laughs> the ones who have the education, they don't like having land taken from them. So, you had a question. Speaking of land reform, I, I mean, the borders in the uh, Middle East is drawn by Brits. A lot of straight lines, and it, it really has nothing to do with the culture or religion. Yeah. Now, why, after, they became independent. Why didn't they erase the borders and make their own borders that were more to their liking? Well, they can. Good question. Uh, this is a very so. Yeah, the basically British good dudes, right? They call it arbitrary lines. Ah. If you talk to them, they say they did it based on some formula of like culture. And, Mm -hmm. For example, you know, if there is a line into the Kurdish area that separates Kurdistan from in Iran from the Turkish side. That has created a big conflict throughout years. Now, asking the British why they did that, they say because the side that was on Iran's side, they are more 
Iranian type culture, you know. The other side was more Turkish side. In terms of the culture and the way they speak and some of the rules and things that they had. I don't know that of course was how arbitrary it was, you know. But they didn't want uh, the Kurds to come together. That's right. That's right. they broke it up to right. purposely right. stop them from being yeah. 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 They were they were very <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. They were crafty. Yeah. 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 And because of the Armenian all of that, all that conflict, they were trying to split all that up. And, yeah. and I mean look what I mean it's colonialization. <clears throat> That's what happened. I mean <laughs> look what happened to Africa. Artificially chopped up. You know. Can I, can I just, because you asked the question early, early on about war and potential war, I mean, you know in your culture so, and in the country so well, I mean, do, do people in Iran, do they want war, you think? I mean, well, they already went through the eight-year war in Iraq, and even that, I come from actually that region that was right, inflicted by the war, and my family was there, and we had to go to another place. Uh, it was a devastating war. Many people lost their lives. He set the country back so many years. Nobody wants a war. I don't think even the government can handle a war anymore. And people are not as zealous as those years that, you know, the young people would go to defend their countries for whatever they could. Nowadays, you know, nobody is happy with the situation, and they think actually the Iranian government is to be blamed for some of the conflicts, even the ones that are outside Iran, Syria, the Yemen, the Palestine, Israel issues, all those things. Why they say we are here to defend the poor and the underprivileged, it's not necessarily all that. So, because I mean, they're trying to, in their, in their saying, they're saying that you're protecting the Yemenis and you're with the Shiites, the Houthis and the Hezbollah of Lebanon to protect these people. Mm -hmm. But there could be another reason for it and they're basically, they're, they're taking the, I think of the word, the borders further away from Iran, so the conflict is right. some, yeah. somewhere else. So is there not? So Israel is not right next to Iran. Or it's diversionary. Mm -hmm. it, it's diversionary. Yeah, diversion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, to answer your question again, I don't think they, nobody, anybody wants war, but who knows? But not yeah. one happy enough to revolt against the government. Yeah. But they would revolt against the job. <laughs> well, that is against the government, though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but when you're going to get killed and imprisoned and raped, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. difficult to have that courage, right? I mean, it's a very difficult yeah. thing to do. Uh, uh, but the, we had that? the cleric. Yeah, we had the cleric that was recently assassinated here last week. Yes, I was just going to, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, and obviously they shut down all the foreign correspondence. And they shut down social media, so now it's very difficult to know what's going on. But but is are we going to see more of that? Is that happening, and we're not That's learning right. about it? Yeah. Do you think, or what? What is your perception? Yeah, so it, the you know terrorism and killing clergies and all this or that. It has been there before, even just right after the revolution. I mean, they bombed. The, House of Assembly, they assassinated the mm -hmm. Prime Minister. They, a lot of those happened early on, but in my opinion, that's not the way to change. No. And, and most people in Iran, they don't think that's the way to do it, even though it's very difficult to raise your voice against this regime yeah. because they put you in prison, they can easily kill you just like Massa. Uh, and many other ones, uh, they even killed children, they have blinded people by shooting into their eyes, all these things. But despite all that, people don't think by, I mean, there are a few people who think, oh yeah, kill this, kill that, done. 
I personally don't think that's the, that's going to help when they have such a strong network that is already in place and it has to take from within for any changes to happen. And of course people's push. Is it the uh, religious leaders and government believe that they relax one aspect of religion, like hijab? They will question the other aspects of it. That's the, at mm -hmm. least for the hardliner, that's the yeah. major red line. Yeah. If they go through that, everything else will crumble. Now, some people say, oh, hijab is not our main issue. Who cares about it? The issue is economy. You know, the fact that we don't have mm -hmm. jobs, we don't have mm -hmm. bread to put on the table. But if that's true, for sure. But I think they go hand in hand. I think. The cultural aspects of the situation versus the economical aspect, and of course social, but everything else, they got all come together. And if people can take one uh, uh, one trophy, whatever you call it, one uh, achievement, that would be hijab, for example. It's already a great achievement, and that's and they're working so hard not to let it happen. But from what I'm hearing from home, I'm talking to my family, they say people are walking on the streets with mm -hmm. jobs and they don't even care. It's interesting sure. because you really don't see it. Um, you don't see it on television. Yeah, you don't. You don't hear about it. Either. It's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. So yes. they have it relaxed and unofficially. So unofficially, even though they say no way, and actually they're tolerating it. They are. Yeah. It's kind of com conflicting. What I'm hearing is also there is another side to it that, say for example, uh, they say those who want to go to an event, <coughs> they come to this gathering. They have to have their job, and if not, they will shut down that this uh, assembly or this shop or that supermarket, if they allow people to come in, and they have done some of that too. But people are saying, okay, we're going to just completely boycott those places that are saying we are not allowed. Mm -hmm. We won't shop from them, so, <laughs> you know. Would you say it's a lot of convenience for the government? <laughs> I think it has been going on for 40 years, so they want to keep it. Uh, but it's something that maybe unofficially they will let it go. Maybe I um, will see. I think the, the struggle continues. It's not done, even though temporarily it's kind of suppressed <laughs> by the killings and jailing people. It's there. And we talk to yeah. you know, 40 years ago when I was there, you couldn't say a word or you couldn't do anything that would be construed against the government. Mm -hmm. But since then, there has been uprisings after all, every five to 10 years, there has been something. And they have big time suppressed it. It has come to the point that we would say the majority of the people know what this regime is all about. Nobody likes them, even though some people go and vote, but the voting has gone down yeah. significantly. Even from within the system, there are people who don't no longer believe in the entity, the whole Islamic entity, you know, as a uh, state-governed religious system. They don't anymore take that as a as a viable, you know, situation. But they're they are trying to keep it, of course, because there is this minority who wants to keep things under control because they have a lot of uh, financial benefits from them. I mean, they're, they're the ones who are telling people to wear a job. And they're the ones who send their kids to the United States, European countries, and they don't wear, wear a job. So, uh, yeah, one, one more yeah, so, question. So the dark side still, though, is you know, the imprisonment, the beatings. I mean, I remember I used to take horseback riding lessons at uh, a military stable. My, I, my father would drive me down and drive me back. 
And um, on the way back, we always passed this prison. It was an even, even prison. Have you heard of yep. yeah. yeah. And my father said every single time that is a terrible place. Mm -hmm. it is. It's a very terrible, terrible place. I don't want to say anything about my own personal family experiences, but yeah. I mean, a terrible place. It is uh, horrific. Yeah, okay. and I never forgot that, you know, because every time we came home and we drove by it, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing every time. Yeah. I want to ask Kathleen. Mm -hmm. uh, we're running out I of know. time. What, what do you have that you want uh, to share with us before? Oh, well, I just want to perhaps echo, I mean, what we, uh, the, some of the questions were uh, that we have to raise, is there any future for any agreement between the U.S. and, um, and Iran? And I think we do have to change our mindset um, regarding the, uh, Iran, that it is, it a, it is a, has a, long and great culture and um, we have to understand it better uh, and um, it's one of the millennia cultures so that's right right yeah I mean, it's one of the yeah yeah the yeah. most important cultures in the world Gen Z. Gen Z. <laughs> yeah I mean I really um, and so I think we have to learn more about Iran and keep an open eye um, of course the regime today was very um, anti-American because of the history uh, of domination and people don't like to be dominated. No one does. Uh, I mean, that's the case with the Palestinians and for others. Um, and so uh, we have to keep an open mind. And I think though we can't impose our institutions on them. I think we just have to understand and let them resolve their uh, differences. If to get over the nuclear question. Yes. yes. And the, yeah. Nuclear, yeah. Get it. Yeah. Um, the, actually, you know, our breaking up the agreement, I think you would all say, was stupid yes. uh, and I think it just showed I mean they they gained they gained, they gained. They gained. and so but we elected Trump what whether we'll we negotiate you know yeah. so yeah. Uh, we didn't cover every question, but I think we... <laughs> any thoughts? Any, I was just dying to hear, I mean, several of us asked about, like, your, the connection with the alliances with Russia versus Saudi Arabia versus Israel, or are there any of those, are there any oh. points you can just throw out? Well, I know we have to end, but um, with respect to... I don't care. It's pouring rain out. You don't want to go out there right now. It's pouring out. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I think whether the Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran thing will will draw. as Marta was saying um, life has changed and there are all kinds of realignments because of um, economic issues and technological issues and the society I mean we, we really are global and um, it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens. Um, maybe Iran, for instance, um, and Saudi Arabia will arrive at a new agreement with respect to the Palestinians. Well, I think, I think, I think the one thing, though, about MBS, I mean, there's all these power structures going on. Right? Yes. And so MBS also wants to undermine Biden. Yeah. So that's part that's right. of this strategy, right? Because he would love to have a family in charge that's more like him <laughs> that yeah. he can wheel and deal with. Uh, um, yeah. But there's also he wants nuclear power. He wants nuclear, nuclear weapons power. also. Yeah. And so there's this, this different imbalance of how he's going to achieve that and whether he's going to get it from Pakistan, North Korea, because we don't want him to have it. But he doesn't want anyone to be able to touch South. Look, look. I mean, can we touch North Korea now? What are our options? We've waited too long. Yeah. Right? 
I mean, we can't. What I mean, without I mean, now the, the right the stakes are raised every year with North Korea. And so he learned that lesson, right? He's watching that and he's saying, yeah, they can't touch me and I don't want anyone to touch me. Yeah. I don't want to be told I can't kill someone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the time okay, that we have to yeah. end, unfortunately. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. And, uh, we'll yeah, great. That would have been a waste of time. Oh, it was so much better. Well, so how about the next time? I think everybody really like yeah, you around the topic. How about we get uh, the so, keep, keep continue for the uh, for next time uh, topic sure. discussion group. Uh, pick up sure. the next uh, sure. next time. I think that's time. a great idea because we're only halfway yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. or okay. through. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, thank you.